Hello and welcome back to Seconds Out. It's always a pleasure to be joined by one of the best minds in boxing to pick Kevin Barry, but joined by the magic of the internet, I must say as well, to two passing ships. We were when I was over in Las Vegas, but I know that you had bigger fish to fry on your hands with the renovations at the gym. But Kevin, how's life treating you? Mate, I'll tell you what, firstly, look, I was so gutted not to get together with you. And I think because of what happened last time, I, I owe you a nice dinner next time you do come over. And but look, mate, I'd love, love to have you in the gym and I'd love you to see what what we're doing with it at the moment with the uh, NFL players and what my son Taylor in particular has created there. It's really something special. Um, but look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we didn't get together. Not a problem at all. And Kevin, if you're getting dinner, I'll get dessert. <laughs> well, that'll be a, that'll be cheap for you because I don't eat dessert. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I do drink. Hey, but I do drink beer. There you go. You can have one of those. Too. I might join <laughs> you as well. And getting into the heavyweight action, someone who'll be enjoying the spores of war. I wanted to start off with Joe Parker, your former charge, uh, right. his display against. Gilles Zhang. Not many people fancied him in that fight. And in moments, you'd be forgiven for not fancying him as well, too, because he was sent to the canvas twice, but he rose and he got the victory. What was your conclusions from the fight? Well, I tell you what, I, I watched the fight um at a bar called Headquarters, who have been as a sponsor of Joe's for many years in New Zealand, and they had a huge screen set up, and there were a couple of hundred people there who who got up early. On the, um, I believe it was a Saturday morning in New Zealand to watch that um, tremendous performance. There's no doubt about that. When you look at what Parker has done in back to back fights, fighting two of the scariest punches in the heavyweight division, and he's been a big underdog on both those fights and, and has come up uh, trumps both times, it shows, the, it shows the heart, the durability, the skill of Joseph Parker. And, uh, you know, once again, at the age of 32, he puts himself in a very solid position where, you know, if he can, uh, if he can get things right in the rematch with Zhang, he's going to find himself fighting for a world heavyweight title again. So look, great performance. Um, I always thought it was a very difficult fight. And, and uh, personally for myself, as soon as Zhang got on the scales at 291 pounds, I thought, oh, my God, here's the red flag for me. If he doesn't get Joe out of there um, in the first six rounds, Parker has every chance to win this fight. I thought it was an, an undisciplined weight. I thought it was um, Zhang and his team taking Joe too lightly looking at what Joe Joyce did to him previously and what they had done to Joe Joyce. And they thought it was going to be a very easy fight that they were going to knock Joe down and knock him out. And uh, of course, you know, we saw Joe hit the canvas a couple of times, but as we know about Joseph Parker, he's very resilient. He's very durable and he's one tough guy. And as soon as that bell started for round seven, I knew we had a different fight on our hands now mm -hmm. and we saw we saw one guy uh, go backwards um throw no punches and probably lose most of the second half of the fight and a, a second fighter a joe joe parker getting a, his second wind and uh throwing some putting some nice combinations and just doing enough every round to stay out of trouble and to sc score enough points to win the rounds and I thought it was a very fair decision, um, a, a very uh, tremendous win for Parker. With the rematch likely to be invoked by the Zhang team, you mentioned there about the red flags, which you think they'd go to arrest the second time round. Do you feel that that's the way forward? If Zhang is going to try and get the win, he's got to drop the weight. He's got to oh. build the stamina as well and try to you know put the pressure on past that sixth round mark if he's to turn the tide on on the decision the first time around well look we know that zhang has has had stamina problems at various stages of his career early in his career in particular gosh he he couldn't really go past five rounds mm -hmm. 
and they, you know, it was widely reported that he had a medical condition that they had addressed. Um, his stamina was back. But look, when you look at a guy like Zhang, he's had 12 first round KOs. Uh, he's only been the distance seven times in his career, and five of those were early in his career fighting four and six rounders. Over the last eight years, Zhang has gone the distance on two occasions. Whereas you look at Joseph Parker, he has fought and gone 12 rounds on before this fight on 10 different occasions. He's had wars you know, with Carlos Takum and Andy Ruiz that had set him up to become a 12-round fighter. We know he has the durability. We know he has the stamina. Um, I think the, the biggest problem with Zhang is over the last three years of his career, he has put on 35 pounds. He has gone from, from 256 to 291. Now, that is, you know, that is not the way that a 40-year-old is going to stay in shape to be able to be a, a, a heavyweight world champion. We know that he has shocked the world with his, with his two performances against Joe Joyce, and especially the second one where he looked like the most scariest bogeyman in the heavyweight division. But I think, uh, you know, when you see someone like Parker, who's been down before, he's been down four or five times, he goes down twice in the fight, but he gets back up again. Mm. It, it, changes, it changes how scary Zhang really is now. Um, you know, when you're up in age and when you're getting towards the end of your career, like Zhang is at the age of 40, you've got to do everything right. You've got to live a clean life. You've got to live a disciplined life. And obviously his stamina is a huge problem. And the bottom line was he was fit to go six rounds, not to go 12. Hmm. Kevin, can I ask you, how different do you see from a trainer to trainer level your version of Joe Parker and Andy Lee's version of Joe Parker? What are the main differences you see in those two fighters? You know, I tell you what, I see Joe um, a little bit more mature now, making uh, making better decisions. Um, he's obviously focusing a lot more on his training and, and staying in the gym than his activities out of the gym. Hmm. Uh, that would be the biggest change for me. I also see that at this stage uh, of, of his career, he's got four children and a fifth on the way. And, uh, you know, he has, a, you know, a different reason for being in the gym. Mm -hmm. I, I also see that with maturity comes a, a whole different avenue of how you respect the sport and uh, and how you appreciate that your window is very, very small and you need to make the right decisions all the time. And it's, if that means sacrificing, uh, then you make those sacrifices. And I think we're seeing Joe make those sacrifices at the moment and getting the getting the right results. I also see the fact that, you know, even after the Joyce fight, you know, he, rather than saying, okay, I, I'm only going to fight in big fights. He invested in himself. He took three fights. Um, and I know some of those fights, you know, it actually cost him to take those fights, but it was very important for him to, to string some wins together. So he strung three wins together last year and it got him the Deontay Wilder fight. Hmm. And um, no one could have known that the Deontay Wilder that lined up to fight Joseph Parker was going to be as completely shot as he was and unable to throw punches. Um, so, you know, Joe made the most of that occasion, got a great upset win, and here he is. He's backed it up by uh, a courageous performance. And I think now with those two wins, uh, everyone wants to see Joe, Joseph Parker carry on and, and get back into uh, heavyweight title contention. Yeah, talking of that title contention, there are a few in the industry now 
uh, matchmaking for Joe Parker and wanting to see those fantasy fights. And these, there's some rematches out there that he'd want to <laughs> put right, I imagine. And with the holding pattern that AJ and Hergovic seem to be in, if that fight doesn't go ahead, maybe wanting to see the Parker and AJ rematch in the future. But what would you like to see, Kevin, next for, for Joe, who seems to, like he has always done, happy to take on all comers? Well, I tell you what, even when they first made this fight, I actually thought that the better fight for Joe was Herkovich. Mm. And I thought that Joe's uh, superior boxing skills and superior speed were perfect for Herkovich. I thought that out of out of Herkovich and Zhang, Zhang was by far the more dangerous fight and had by far the, the bigger punch. So, um, look... There are some great fights out there for Joseph Parker, but I mean, he he at the moment will be focusing only on one fight, and that's the rematch with Zhang. Getting that, getting his hand raised again uh, with Zhang in the other corner and being in a position to uh, to fight for the world title will be what he is totally focusing on at the moment. But Take that aside, there is, there's the rematch with uh, Andy Ruiz, which is a fight that uh, boxing uh, boxing fans would love to see that fight. Uh, just the style of both guys make that a great fight. Um, we've got Dillian White now back in the action. People want to see Parker fight Dillian White again. Another another great fight. Um, you know, uh, Obviously, the AJ fight, well, it was pretty one-sided. Uh, we had a referee that wouldn't let them fight. But, I mean, uh, in hindsight, you know, when you look at uh, the way Anthony Joshua is letting his hands go now, you know, you want to be very careful standing there and trading punches with a guy like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, then, you know, that's another fight that that, uh, that Joe will look for. But I think the definitely the Andy Ruiz fight and the Dillian White fights are, are, are two fights outside of title contention that uh, Parker would really want to get amongst. Moving on to, and you mentioned Anthony Joshua now really kind of letting his hands go. Are we seeing the Joshua of old now? Are we seeing that resurgent uh, version of him now in against Ngannou, who was able to dispatch of him? Uh, with relative ease as compared to Tyson Fury who really struggled against him but is this can we say Anthony Joshua is back after what he did to Ngannou I'll tell you what um, I for one was very impressed with his performance and actually I'm very impressed with the way he's looked under under Ben Davidson Um, you know which is funny because like you know Ben is a very good defensive coach and and yet Finally, everyone knew what Anthony Joshua had to do. He had to let his hands go. They know that he is a tremendous athlete. He's got great speed. He's got great power. And we watched his three fights before working with Ben. And sure, his jab was improving, um, but he wasn't he wasn't letting the right hand go. He wasn't letting his hook go. He wasn't letting his uppercut go. He still didn't have the confidence of the Anthony Joshua of old. I believe now he has got that confidence back. He knows what he has to do. Um, I told, when I was in New Zealand, I told everyone the fight will be over before the uh, end of the third round. So I missed it by a round, but I expected him to uh, absolutely demolish him and, you know, and, and to put a little bit of order back into the heavyweight mix. Like if, if Nganu had somehow won that fight, it would have been so bad for heavyweight boxing. You know, it would have taken us so long to get that credibility back. And I'm pleased that a statement was made and a definitive statement. Uh, it, it couldn't be any clearer than it was. And I, th- I think we, we're seeing a guy who realises that his 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 form was on hold you know he had lost his confidence he had to get that belief back in himself and I'm, I think he's very confident and comfortable with the team around him at the moment and his last two performances have looked very very spectacular so I, look I'm excited for his potential but we all know in the back of our mind 
We all remember the uh, <laughs> the fight in New York with Andy Ruiz. You know that's always that's always there, mm. and that's why it made the Ngannou fight uh, a marketable fight because he knocked Fury down. And what happens when Joshua gets hit uh, by a huge puncher like him, he'll probably knock Joshua down. So this was in people's minds. So I think, you know, for, for the longest period of time, that's been in the back of Anthony Joshua's mind. Now I think he has got his confidence back. And when 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 he fights with the confidence that he has in his last two fights, he's a, a, a very scary character. Just to change the focus slightly to Nganu for the moment, what can we say about, you said, you know, this we brought some order back to what was a bit chaotic in the heavyweight division. Uh, what does it mean for Nganu against Fury? Was, was that, I don't want to say it, but... Was that just a fluke? Uh, Nganu has said that he wants to continue in boxing, so he'll be having more boxing fights in the future, and he feels that boxing owes him. So what would you do with Nganu next? Do you feel he has a future competitively in the division, at least at the, the highest stakes? Well, I tell you what, of course he wants to stay in boxing. When you look at the money that Nganu's made, like he hit the jackpot getting the Fury fight, mm. he hit it again getting Anthony Joshua. Um, when you look at how hard he has trained and the performances that he gave in the uh, uh, in the octagon, the money he received as champion and the money that he's being paid now, of course he never wants to go back in the octagon at the moment. He wants to get as many big boxing fights as he possibly can. That's just a sheer business decision. Um, look, I think the guy has definitely improved as a fighter. Uh, do I think the first fight was a fluke? No, I think we all realize and we all know now what happened in the first fight. When we look at the the uh, the pitches of Tyson Fury training for Usyk and the Tyson Fury that got in the ring against Ngano, uh, the bottom line is Tyson never trained. Mm. Um, I wish he would have because all his peers were there that day and the, <laughs> and the world was watching. And I think Tyson was a little embarrassed himself that that he allowed that to happen um but he got the win uh and Nganu went on to to other things and it was great for Joshua because he was able to make a definitive statement of the simple fact that he was fighting a guy who had a, a Norton one boxing record who had very limited skill as a boxer who had didn't have the pedigree uh, of a well uh, refined uh amateur and professional boxer like Anthony Joshua and, and uh when Joshua went out there and started throwing uh feints and watching Ngannou um you know fall for every feint move his left hand he just opened that right hand up for him and Joshua thought god I'm in the gym I'm uh, I'm practically in the ring with the novice mm. and he couldn't miss him with those right hands you know it was like um and that's, but that was to be expected because you had one guy with enormous, with enormous training and enormous skill uh, as a professional boxer, and another guy who's a very, very skillful mixed martial artist. Uh, so it, that's how it should happen. Mm -hmm. But look, I'm sure that there'll be fighters out there who want to fight Francis Ngannou. Um, Maybe maybe Joe Joyce will want to crack at him. Mm. Um, you know, th th those sort of fights are interesting and uh, and appealing. Um, yeah, he'll come. He'll come again. He'll come again for the simple fact that he's fought on two major uh, professional boxing cards with the world watching. Um, and he has, like, he has the, the 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 marketing behind him, the promotion behind him, to at some stage come again. He won't be coming again for the twenty million dollars that he got paid for fighting Anthony Joshua, but he will come again. Do you expect the same thing to happen to the next expected opponent for Anthony Joshua? Would we be, believe that to be? Philip Hergovich as the situation moves towards the undisputed and the. IBF title won't be on the line as we believe it to be for the second fight, the rematch between the undisputed uh, fighters contesting for that title. So that leaves 
AJ and Hergovic in that mix to contest for it. But do you believe that AJ will come through that in a similar sort of way he did with Ngannou? Well, I'll tell you what, I look at it this way. I look at not Hergovic's last fight because it was a joke. Hmm. His fight before that when he fought Dempsey McKean. Um, and, you know, McKean's a good, you know, I want to say C-plus type of fighter. And he gave Herkovich real trouble in that fight. And it wasn't until the last round. And it, it didn't even look like ending. And Herkovich finished with a knockout in the 12th round. Now, if I put that Herkovich in the ring with Anthony Joshua, or shall I say, if I put Dempsey McKean in the ring with Anthony Joshua, that fight's over as fast as the Ngano fight. Mm -hmm. um, I think personally, I think that it's a that uh, it's a perfect fight for Anthony Joshua to fight Herkovich. He's faster. He's got better punches. He's got better skill. And I think you know Herkovich, who was a very good amateur, a very powerful amateur. And if you listen to all the stories, everyone who fought him in the amateur said he was one of the hardest punching heavyweights ever. And everyone expected him just to knock everyone out he fought. And that hasn't been the case. Mm -hmm. I think that they have brought him along wrong. They haven't allowed him to develop properly. Um, they've, they hyped him up, putting a whole lot of, for a long, for the longest period of time, a whole lot of fighters who shouldn't have been in the ring with them, who were just in there to go a couple of rounds. And that didn't help him. It ha didn't help him to develop as a fighter. So I think we have a guy now who's sitting in the mandatory position in Herkovic, who really isn't, pre isn't prepared to be a heavyweight world champion. He doesn't, I personally don't think he has the tools or the experience or the or the actual development to be able to be a, a top fighter. That fight between AJ and Garner beforehand, I was saying to people that I'd interviewed in the lead up to it, I was saying that not only did it have obviously significance to AJ's career and his return to getting towards title contention, but also would change heavyweight pers or fans perspective people's perspective on the heavyweights because it's a common opponent again between Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua in the form of Ngannou right. I think the statistic is that of all the common opponents shared um Anthony Joshua is dispatched of the common opponents better than Fury has he's knocked them or stopped them um in their fights um right. the question I wanted to ask you with this is now people are saying and they're cross-referencing the common opponents and this last fight with Ngannou, and right. now saying that Anthony Joshua would beat or knock out Fury if the two were ever to meet. And we know that the Saudis would be looking at that fight as one that they want to have on the calendar one day. Where, where do you stand on that for the common opponents, for the recency of Fury's performances? Um, does it change your mind on how a potential Fury versus AJ fight goes? Well, I'll tell you what, the first thing, when you talk about common opponents, there's the obvious way to look at that is Tyson Fury is a tremendous boxer. Um, very skillful, very clever, doesn't knock everybody out. Anthony Joshua is a very big puncher and for the longest period of time knocked everyone out. Um, and, you know, until he tried to become a boxer for a, for a, a period of his career where the fights went the distance. Um, at that last performance, sure, it's got everyone's attention, and everyone is thinking, "Wow, if he could land that right hand on uh, on Tyson Fury." And we know Tyson's been down. He's been he's been down against Wilder. He's been down against other fighters. Um, personally, I think the biggest the biggest factor in, into that whole equation when those two guys fight. Um, is the fact that I believe Tyson Fury's had in recent years a lot tougher fights than Anthony Joshua has had. Um, I also believe that Tyson Fury has been a lot harder on his body, both mentally and physically, 
uh, than Anthony Joshua has. Um, you know, because of that, it, it's it's definitely going to weigh things up uh, a lot more even than what they would have been two years ago. You know, we've seen this new Anthony Joshua uh, develop and show up. Uh, we just need him to keep showing up. Uh, I've always been a massive Tyson Fury fan. Uh, I've always thought he is the number one boxer in the world, and I still do. And I think that the that if we can get the Tyson Fury um, uh, who is fit mentally and physically, like the photos we saw before he had his eye cut and, and was and withdrew from the Usyk fight, if we can get that guy into the ring. I think he's the undisputed heavyweight champion. Hmm. One thing I will say uh, when you talk about, you know, Joshua fighting Fury in the in uh, Saudi, that would be such a shame. And I know that this it will happen because they'll offer twice as much money as both guys will get to fight in the UK. But that is a UK fight. That's a fight that needs to be in Wembley or somewhere like that. That's the biggest fight ever between two British, you know, heavyweights. Providing they both keep moving along the same track, that's a fight that breaks all the records and belongs in the UK. That's that's my ten cents worth. And it only took Kevin Barry, not from the UK, to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I think that's a great place to leave it. Appreciate you giving me your time and giving me your thoughts as well on the heavyweight division. Always a pleasure, but the pleasure is all mine. Looking forward already to the next time we meet up too. Thanks, Eamon. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend, and I'll, I've been on seconds out with you.